let's go through all of this with my think tank. A great one for the next hour. We've got some brilliant minds that can weigh in on this and other stories. Lord Zimmerman is a criminal defense attorney. Imran Asari Newbell, defense attorney, former prosecutor, and media law professor, legal journalist Candace O'Kelly. Let's start with you, Lawrence. Um, the list of potential um, appointments to the Supreme Court, nominations by the president, has one that really sticks out in terms of age, 38 years old. Is that too young to be a Supreme Court justice? Ted, I almost fell off my chair when you flash it across the screen that a 38-year-old, holy, holy cow. I mean, for a lot of reasons, yes, it's way too young. Why? She doesn't have a lot of experience. Uh, Supreme Court justice is obviously a lifetime appointment. It should be somebody who has a lot of experiences and handle a lot of cases, has a big body of work. What kind of body of work do you have when you're 38? That, that's just too young. I mean, that almost scares me when I saw that. Uh, there's just not much there. There's not much there to even glean from. What could you do at, in 38 as a 38 year old if you became a lawyer at 26? There's just not enough there to become a Supreme Court justice and to be a Supreme Court justice for another, I don't know, 50 years. That's uh, that's just that doesn't work for me. Imran, there's a, t a trend of picking and both parties are, are guilty of it, younger and younger justices, um, because, of course, it's a lifetime appointment. So you want that person to live a long life on the court. Um, and the problem is you're missing out on a 63, 64-year-old brilliant jurist who is actually at the right age and the right point in their career to be a qualified justice. What's your take on the politicization of the high court over the past few decades and where we are now as a country? Yeah, I think over the past few decades has been uh, ever increasingly political, and I think that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, the true politicization of uh, nominating uh, a justice to the Supreme Court. I mean, you can't divorce the process from politics. I get that. But right now, over the last few years, you've seen uh, justices being picked for the Supreme Court, not necessarily for their experience, but for the legacy that they may have in the decades to come. So that's that goes to what you're saying, that they're younger and younger and younger, the nominees to the bench, because each political party seems to be looking to get their respective judge on the bench, whether it be conservative or liberal. And I think that's what we see here. I agree, 38, um, that's very, very young. Um, you know, that's not necessarily the years of experience that you get, not necessarily from trying cases or uh, writing briefs, but just life experience. 38 is pretty young. Now, couple that with uh, uh, the years to come in terms of a legal uh, docket of experience. I don't think that at that ripe age, you're going to have it. So I think you see the ever increasing politicization of the process. Um, and we cannot forget that this is the highest legal court in the country, the grand Supreme Court, and you can't take a nominee nominating someone lightly. Uh, someone really has to have all the qualifications, and I think years of experience really lends itself to that. Candace, uh, what's your take on the state of affairs in terms of the nomination process, and not only specifically what we're dealing with uh, with the passing of Ruth Ginsburg, but what um, we've seen as a trend over the past let's say, decade? Well, you know, I want to comment, first of all, on the fact that when we look at the Constitution, the Constitution doesn't say anything necessarily about how many years somebody has to have in terms of somebody that can serve on the court. Of course, we've seen a lot of people, number one, that have had great experience in the court system and uh, served as federal uh, circuit judges and and not been great candidates and did not get the confirmation. The, the other thing is that in terms of this whole process, what we're looking at is, you know, many people are one issue voters. And so when we look at these voters um, and we look at the people who the president who is potentially looking at, we're going to look at someone like an Amy Coney, Coney Barrett. And, and, you know, I saw a headline today, you know, why Amy Coney Barrett doesn't like your uterus. So when we look at that, we're going to be looking at a lot of politics in and around some of the content. I think that certainly, of course, the, the experience is very important, but we're going to have to examine what it is they have been talking about 
on the federal bench? What are the issues that they've been making known? Um, Amy, who was at the uh, president's, um, uh, who met with the president today, uh, you know, she is someone who's a devout Catholic. She's someone who believes that the law and the kingdom of God should be merged together. So I think that that is what is going to take precedence here. Uh, the, the issues that these particular uh, candidates, potential candidates, are going to bring to the table. Lawrence, the, um, the idea that um, reproductive rights um, is the litmus test, that, that we've been talking about this for decades, and this is the big... Um, the, the big one for so many people, but there's so much more that the justices decide every single session that has nothing to do with that. Um, how focused has this process become on these two, three issues, including abortion? I mean, I'm sorry that I'm on court TV having to talk about abortion rights and all of that. I wasn't expecting to <laughs> go into, po po into politics. I well, get the, the, the point is, how many, TV. I, give people a, a sense of what a Supreme Court just, justice decides on on an annual basis. There are so many cases, and it, it has nothing to do with these hot-button issues, the majority of the decisions made by the high court. Right. I mean, these hot button issues are not really what's on the court's docket. In fact, I think a case this year, they petitioned, uh, I can't remember what state, to deal with abortion, and the Supreme Court wouldn't take it up. So it's not every year they even having these issues. Um, you know, this year they have health care. It's on the docket, I think, 10 days after the election or seven days. So that's a, that's a pretty big issue, whether the ACA, also known as Obamacare, is constitutional, and you can talk about pre-existing conditions. I mean, the court deals with weighty issues, important issues that help us as Americans. They help decide very important, sometimes very minute things that may or may not affect everybody, but they're very heady things. And there are one-issue voters, but I'm not a one-issue voter, and I hope this doesn't devolve into a very nasty process like the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings. Imran, the loss of Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, is significant. This is a, a, a special person. She transcended the legal world. Um, your take on what she leaves as a legacy and what she leaves as an open hole on the, on the bench? Well, you know, I think uh, her legacy really precedes her. I, we, we've seen documentaries about her. We've really seen a judge, uh, a Supreme Court justice, become a pop icon. So I think that speaks uh, for itself. She, she speaks not only for uh, the generations of legal scholars and attorneys and judges uh, that have looked to her and looked to her rulings for inspiration, but also to this younger generation who have, have really made her a pop culture icon. Um, the whole she, she leaves on the bench, well, I think it really is the balancing act between the conservative bench and the liberal bench. And I think that's why we see the political process now uh, with the Republicans racing to get a nominee on the floor of the Senate and the Democrats looking to uh, stall that process as, you know, any way they can. Uh, but, you know, she really is. And, uh, you know, at the top of the hour, I hate to correct you, but uh, you said she was from the Bronx. But being a former Brooklyn ADA and uh, uh, a, a proud uh, son of Brooklyn, she was from Brooklyn. So uh, us New Yorkers hold a special place for Ruth Bader Ginsburg in our heart, especially those from Brooklyn. So she leaves a really storied legacy, and she's an inspiration for women, uh, women attorneys, uh, and, and really, really really was a groundbreaking justice. Brooklyn, indeed. My, uh, my, apologize, <laughs> uh, my apologies. Candace, your take on, and, and, on, on the justice as a person uh, and what she was able to accomplish and the hole that she has now left. Uh, as was mentioned, she's an icon. And she's not just an icon for female attorneys or um, anybody who's just a woman. For males, females, every day that she was on the bench, she fought for the people, whether they were a man at, or a woman. As she said, she's been quoted as saying, you know, she is a human being and she's fighting for human beings that are out there, whether they're men or women. When we look at some of the cases that she really put forward from, from Ledbetter to transgender rights to, um, uh, you know, um, military bases um, being integrated with men and women, there's so much that she has put on the table and such a legacy that it's going to be hard to follow. Um, and, and I also think that this is 
one of those times where people are, are, are just in mourning. And it's interesting to see the way that people are mourning over this woman in a way that we haven't seen before when it comes to a lot of justices. And that's something to take into consideration when we think about the legacy that she has left behind, as well as the power that she had over the court um, in her very, sometimes very small voice, but very big ways of doing things. Mm, yeah, well said. We're going to talk a little bit more about the court at the end of the program with the 13th juror. We're going to talk about uh, whether or not it should be a lifetime appointment. But coming up next, the Snake King murder trial out of Missouri. That's coming up. Stay with us. Welcome back now to the murder of an exotic snake dealer who was found dead in his warehouse. At first, friends and family thought maybe it was a snake that killed him, but investigators quickly determined it was a gunshot. Last week, his wife was in a Missouri courtroom. She's facing murder charges for the death of her husband. We'll get to that in just a minute, but first, here's some background. Ben Rennick was one of the country's preeminent snake breeders. This girl, very tame. Rennick appeared at reptile shows selling his snakes to enthusiasts all over the country. That ended in June of 2017 when he was found dead at his breeding facility. I thought he'd been attacked by a snake um, because his, his skull was crushed. Um, but he was standing exactly where he always stood, right there in the facility. Sam Rennick is Ben's brother. He got the panicked call that night from Ben's wife, Lynn Lee. It wasn't until well after the police arrived and that I was told that he was actually murdered by a, by a gun, by a weapon, and I, I didn't. I found that very hard to believe. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. Nobody would ever want to hurt Ben. According to police, Ben was the victim of multiple gunshot wounds, with one being a contact wound to the head. Nothing was stolen, and based on where his body was found, investigators seemed to be convinced of one thing, that the killer was known to Rennick. But Ben's murder went unsolved for more than two years, until this January, a break. Identified only as BB in the police report, he broke the case wide open with information leading to the arrest of Ben's wife, Lynn Lee Rennick, and her ex-boyfriend, Michael Humphrey. The two are charged with first-degree murder in the death of Ben Rennick. According to the probable cause affidavit, B.B. told police he was having an affair with Lynn Lee while she was married to Ben. They continued to see each other after Ben died, even fathering a child with her. According to B.B., Lynn Lee told him she feared Ben would divorce her over the money problems with the spa, so... With the help of ex-boyfriend Michael Humphrey, she planned to shoot Ben after a previous poisoning attempt failed to kill him. B.B. told police that Lynn Lee and Humphrey went to the snake farm. Lynn Lee told Ben that Humphrey was an old friend who wanted to see the snakes. After a tour, they returned to the car to retrieve a gun. B.B. told police Lynn Lee walked in with the gun and shot Ben multiple times. Lynn Lee and Humphrey then returned to Lynn Lee's spa business where Lynn Lee took off her clothes and took a shower, giving the clothes to Humphrey to dispose of with the gun and shell casings. It was a huge relief. We, we were happy to finally get some answers. However, of course, they were ugly. You know, hearing that, he, that she attempted to poison him, all of that was new news to us. Finding out that she was having an affair was something we were completely taken, we were shocked. We couldn't have imagined that. That's not the Lindley we knew. That's never the Lindley you knew in cases like this. Uh, Lauren Zimmerman is still with me, along with Imran Ansari and Candace O'Kelly. Uh, on Friday, during a bail hearing, we found out who this BB person was, and it turns out it's a boyfriend of Lindley Rennix, who is the father of her youngest child. And he, according to her defense attorney, threatened to go to police before he went to police. And um, then he also apparently has some, uh, some mental issues. Lauren Zimmerman, the credibility of a witness in cases like this is so crucial for jurors. When a witness 
has something like a shared child and is using and threatening the now defendant with that, um, with I'm going to tell police that you shot your husband. How important is that when it comes out, assuming it comes out at trial to jurors? It's very important, you know, as a defense lawyer, you try to look for the bias and you try to find the reason and the motivation some may not be truthful. And in a lot of cases, for example, you see in a lot of child molestation cases, a lot of the allegations come out from a custody battle or someone someone wants custody or they're not getting what they want. Similarly here, when there's a relationship, another person, I guess it's human nature, unfortunately, will try to use something to bend the other person to their will. And that's what we look for. We try to find all that information and investigate it. And then we present that, we cross-examine on it, and we, we show it to the jury because that really goes to their credibility. The problem, uh, of course, Imran, is that jury, jurors love stories that make sense. And um, wife killing husband for money makes sense. Right. And, uh, you know, specifically in this case, I think there is a, uh, a good amount of, of forensic evidence related to a financial motive. Um, we see that her spa business was failing. We know that he had a one million dollar uh, life insurance policy taken out not too uh, sh not too long before his murder. Um, and then you see that there's a, an affair going on. So I think that uh, the prosecutors are going to be looking to put together a case where they take her confession the information that they received from uh, BB uh, and corroborate that, corroborate that with other evidence and corroborate that with evidence uh, that shows a motive, a fa financial motive. And I think that may be uh, the sort of evidence that's gonna really tie this case together for the prosecution. Candace, um, there is no murder weapon um, that has been located and um, no physical evidence tying her to this crime. It's also a high profile trial in this area of Missouri. What's your take um, on the facts in the, here? Does she have a fighting chance here? You know, I don't think she has much of a fighting chance. You mentioned the physical evidence that wasn't pres uh, present, but there have been people who have gone to jail and who have served time and been convicted even though there was no DNA evidence or physical evidence that was present. In addition to that, we have so much against her. I mean, you follow the money, you follow the heart. First, you follow the money, and we know... At as was mentioned about the life insurance and the failing business, you follow the heart and you see several affairs and somebody even, um, she even birthed a baby by someone who's now speaking against her. So all of that gets to be a little bit tricky. Let's also not forget the woman who said that um, she tried to help poison uh, her husband. So she's got so much against her, even though there's no physical evidence in terms of connecting her with the scene, there was certainly evidence to connect her with a serious motive um, and the opportunity to make this uh, murder happen. Lawrence, they're gonna attack BB, but then they're also going to attack, as Candace brought up, uh, Lindley's friend who helped with the first attempt to kill him, uh, uh, allegedly, by poisoning. She lied to police at first, but then she did not. And she has confessed and she will be likely the star witness in this case. Can you really attack everybody that comes in successfully if you're the <laughs> defense uh, or is she just going to get overwhelmed here? Um, I mean, look, it's definitely a problem when you, when you have them coming at you from all different angles. I mean, it creates credibility issue with the defense that everyone's making this up. And then you got to figure out why they all concocting it. Who's the, who's the main person that's feeding out this story? It's definitely trouble. It's definitely hard. I'm not saying there's easy defense here, and it's going to be uh, problems for, for her for sure. Imran, in a high-profile case, a lot of times a plea deal is more difficult to get because prosecutors know that eyeballs are on them and they want to have a conviction. Is that going to factor in here as we get closer to trial? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, anytime you have a high profile case, whether you're going to be on the prosecution, where you're going to be uh, aiming for that uh, conviction, because like you said, all eyes are on you. Also, you have uh, a, a victim's family who have serious considerations and uh, uh, an interest in seeing that conviction uh, and seeing justice for uh, the decedent. Uh, but you also for for the defense on their side. Also, they 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 have to have uh, and really wrangle with that publicity on a high profile case themselves. Uh, you know, I, I 
I've had the opportunity of really handling uh, a high profile case recently uh, in my firm and, and continue to. And every move that you make, uh, everything that you file in court, everything that you say uh, to the press, you know, you're very cognizant of it because, you know, all those eyes are on on the case. Um, similarly here, the prosecution is going to be looking to, to really seal the deal on a conviction, whether it be that trial or through a negotiated plea deal. But uh, that's going to be a consideration that they're going to have in every decision they make. And likely uh, no sweetheart deals in a case like this. All right, we're going to step aside. And when we come back, we'll talk about another high-profile case, the Ahmad Arbery case. Julia Jade will join us when we return. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julia Janae with your legal news break. We begin with breaking news tonight out of Los Angeles. The second deputy critically wounded in an ambush shooting has been released from the hospital. Los Angeles Sheriff Alex Villanueva's tweet tonight says, Good news. Both of our deputies from the hashtag Compton ambush have been discharged from the hospital. He adds that they're both resting and have a long road to recovery. That shooting from two Saturdays ago was captured on video. A warning, the images are disturbing. The search continues for the male suspect seen here who approached the two deputies as they sat in their squad car and opened fire on them. Authorities say they have some promising leads but have made no arrests. A reward for information on that suspect has grown to over $800,000. And in Kentucky, the Louisville Metro Police Department is canceling all vacations for officers as the city braces for a big announcement from the attorney general. In a statement, the department said they're preparing for an imminent decision in Breonna Taylor's shooting death. All requests for days off are canceled until further notice. They're putting up barricades in the downtown area and boarding up the federal courthouse. Exactly when the decision will come down isn't known. But it could be sometime this week or next. Taylor was shot and killed by police in March when they entered her apartment using a controversial no-knock warrant. The city settled a civil lawsuit filed by Taylor's family last week. Attorney General Dan Daniel Cameron is expected to say if his office plans to charge the officers involved or not. And new details in a Georgia case we've been following closely. Prosecutors in the Ahmad Arbery case have decided not to seek the death penalty. The special prosecutors appointed to that case are taking capital punishment off the table against father and son defendants Gregory and Travis McMichael and their co-defendant William Lee Bryant. All three are charged with murder in the February 23rd death of Arbery. The maximum punishment the three defendants now face is life without the possibility of parole. Police say Arbery was jogging in a South Georgia neighborhood when the McMichaels chased him in their vehicle. Travis McMichael fatally shot an unarmed Arbery several times. William Bryan joined that chase and captured the incident on his cell phone. All three men have pleaded not guilty and claimed Travis was defending himself when he killed Arbery. That wraps up your Court TV legal news break. On the docket tonight, a dis disturbing case out of Arizona about to go to trial. A nurse at a long-term care facility is accused of raping and impregnating an incapacitated patient. The staff at Hacienda Healthcare had no idea the patient was even pregnant until apparently she gave birth. After numerous delays, Nathan Sutherland is prepared to go before a judge to face the horrific allegations against him. Take a look. One of our patients just had a baby and we had no idea she was pregnant. Ever since that dramatic December day played out at Hacienda Healthcare, a lot has happened. But now we're getting a look at the official police report from the Hacienda investigation. We'll warn you, parts of it are disturbing. For example, when the victim who police confirm was unable to talk, move, swallow, or breathe normally was brought to the hospital, a doctor said she showed signs of being sexually active and having given birth before, suggesting this may not have been the only time the woman had a baby. Interviews with Hacienda nurses and employees indicate the woman's stomach had been bloated for four months and she had no menstruation for six months. A doctor ordered an ultrasound, but the test was declined by the diagnostic company. The police report even says that in 2002, the victim was part of a group of patients who were believed to have been touched inappropriately. Got a DNA, have the person in custody, and he's in jail. And then there's the accused, Nathan Sutherland, arrested after a DNA match. In the report, employees 
police say after the baby was born, Sutherland called in sick for the next two to three Sundays and told one employee he was going through a rough time and asked her to pray for him. And I will tell you something that, that as an investigator, as a, as a member of our community that I look at as important is, this was an employee rather than a stranger who made his way into the facility. Police say Sutherland was a licensed practical nurse who had direct contact with the victim. Through a court order, they got DNA from Sutherland and say it matched with the victim's baby. Mr. Sutherland, may I have your full name, please? Nathan Darcy Sutherland. And your date of birth? 331-1982. Standing next to his attorney in court today, a judge reads off the serious charges he's facing. A prosecutor off camera says the state will not settle for anything less than prison time. The defendant sexually assaulted a very vulnerable adult who had no capacity to resist, no capacity to cry out, uh, no capacity to do anything other than be subject to the, what the defendant did to her. One of our, our concerns is were there other victims or how many times this occurred. Uh, we may not know how many times this occurred. The only allegation at this point is that there's DNA. So do you believe the client is innocent? I believe the client is entitled to due process and proof beyond a reasonable doubt as all defendants are. In court, Gregan told the judge there's no proof Sutherland is the guy. There's no direct evidence that Mr. Sutherland has committed these acts. Um, I know at this point there is DNA. Mr. Sutherland will have a right and have his own DNA expert. So what can you tell us about the DNA you, you were talking I about? can't tell you anything, but I haven't received discovery, but there's an allegation of DNA. That's all I can tell you at this point. And so you guys, do you plan to challenge that? Well, we, we plan to have it tested, for sure. So you will we'll run your own DNA tests? Oh, correct. Judge set Sutherland's bond at $500,000 cash, which his attorney argued is excessive, since Sutherland does not have a criminal history. All right, still with me, Lawrence Zimmerman, Imran and Sari, the pride of Brooklyn, and Candace O'Kelly. Um, Lawrence, DNA, you've got a baby's DNA and a defendant's DNA. It's not like they're testing a DNA sample from a crime scene that you can attack in a courtroom. Um, it would seem to me this is going to be pretty conclusive, um, w w given the fact that you have basically sample sizes that are, you know, as large, as large as you want. You can do it 100 times. Ted, when I was a young lawyer, I had a very similar case I was appointed to. My client was accused of impregnating his 16-year-old daughter, and the police had, she had an abortion, and they did DNA testing and ended up matching. So I am very familiar how tough these cases are. Certainly, the lawyer must challenge the search warrant to get, get his client's DNA, that maybe he's only fighting shot. I don't know what the probable cause was or what the information was about his client that was sufficient probable cause for a judge to issue a search warrant for his DNA. And I'm not so sure I would I would I would talk about on television that he's going to do independent DNA test because if he doesn't come back with a DNA expert, it's always going to point towards his client. Not necessarily that they could use that at trial, but I wouldn't tip my hand to the prosecution so early on. Imran, uh, a case like this where there seems to be a, a mountain of evidence and the crime itself is so horrifying, where a juror is going to be sitting there listening, going, oh, oh, you had sex with this woman while she was basically in a vegetative state. Uh, um, sometimes the crime itself, whether the defendant's guilty or not, is so horrific that jurors are disgusted to the point where it really hurts defense efforts. Is, that, is this one of them? Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the cases, uh, and I remember when this news first broke about this case, and it's something that really shocks the conscience. So when uh, the defense attorney, let's say this goes to trial, uh, voir dire or jury selection is going to be a, a really a arduous process because it is such uh, egregious facts that we're dealing with um, <clears throat> that you're going to really have a hard time finding a fair and impartial jury uh, because the defendant's really going to be looked at, superimposed on those facts, and you're going to have to constantly remind that, that jury that it's the uh, prosecution's burden to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, but you're going to be fighting against just the, the egregious and salacious allegations against your client. 
With the DNA evidence uh, that really, what, what, at least what we know now, really conclusively shows uh, the link between this defendant uh, and that child, you know, it's really going to be an uphill battle for the defense uh, because these facts settling in uh, in the minds of a jury um, is, is very dangerous if you're looking to, to, to get an acquittal. The defendant has no criminal record. Candace, are you surprised there hasn't been a deal forged in, a, in this case? Maybe it is a high-profile case uh, in Arizona. Maybe that has something to do with it. But given the facts out there, um, you'd think they'd come to some sort of deal. Yeah, you would think so. But I'm going to echo what you said, that, yes, this is disgusting. And, yes, this is something that jurors are going to be aghast about. They're going to make a decision based upon the DNA, as you said, the evidence is so insurmountable, it just speaks for itself. So, yes, he has no criminal record, but here, it just doesn't matter. The, the other part of this is when we look at the um, facility itself, there's a support plan that patients have, and the support plan was not paid attention to. I mean, if you've gone to the sixth grade, if you don't menstruate and your stomach is bloating, you know you're probably pregnant. I don't understand how the staff at this particular facility could not have known this, especially with records back in 2002 saying that perhaps this patient and others, um, you know, were, were messed with in some way. And as you said, in a vegetative state, this is one of those things that um, I would want to see to, to go um, to the jury. I would want to hear what they have to say to see the full extent of the law so that this man could get what he deserves. Lawrence, can you put the facility on trial if you're defending this uh, defendant, uh, saying that uh, she had evidence of sexual activity before, uh, maybe even this individual worked there? Do you go there, or is it that just adds more disgusting levels uh, for a jury who's already, to Candace's point, um, going to be infuriated? Well, first of all, any evidence of her prior consensual or, well, I guess any sex act could be considered rape shield, so it wouldn't come in. But secondly, I'm not so sure what he has to gain by putting them on trial. He worked there as well. I mean, I, I think the issue here is I will tell say, you know, Candace, I don't think this is a case I'd want to try to a jury because um, it sounds terrible. I, I would investigate this man's mental state his mental history and find as much mitigation as I could there and try to present that to the district attorney, to the judge, to try to get a reduced sentence. Now, I don't know all the facts. I don't have this case, but based on what I've been told here, it sounds pretty difficult. And it's not a case you want to try to adjure that DNA. So I look for something and maybe there's mental health issues and it's not a case I'd want to be taken to trial, but that's not my decision. I think Candace <laughs> wasn't saying she wanted to represent him. I think she wants some justice. She prosecuted him. Yes, I get it. Yeah. And, 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 and listen, yeah, and, and as we know, the family is asking for money, and rightfully so. Rightfully so. From the facility. Right. And, and Ted, that's that's really where uh, the facility will be on trial is in that civil suit that Candace just referred to, uh, because you know what they knew previously. Uh, that's going to be a real issue in that civil case. Absolutely, yeah, maybe, and that's Ted. Maybe yeah. Ted, maybe he could cut a deal with the um, with the plaintiffs' lawyers, and then you know admit to it somehow. This way, they get to hacienda on a big you know big verdict to get a, to get towards a big judgment, do a global resolution. Maybe that's the possibility. Yeah, but I think doubt. prosecutors want to want to want him to go to trial, and uh, because it is so. But high the family profile. wants money too, so the fan, the victims have said true that you get yeah so. right. You'll get their blessing. Um, all right, we're going to step aside, take a break, because when we come back, we'll have the 13th juror. This is on the docket. We're watching this case. There's a pretrial conference November 2nd. Uh, trial date is November 9th. Uh, we'll see. Uh, with COVID-19, every trial date that is out there goes away. As it, get, uh, as it approaches, we'll find out November 2nd. Stick with us. 13th juror question next about the Supreme Court. Stay with us. Right now. I will be putting forth a nominee next week. It will be a woman. It will be a woman. All right, there's uh, President Trump talking about uh, the fact that he will be nominating a woman to fill the vacated seat of Justice Ginsburg. Uh, the question of the day to the 13th juror, should the Supreme Court be a lifetime appointment? The comment of the day comes from Cindy Hatchell, and she says, 
I don't think any public office should be a lifetime appointment. I'm in favor of term limits. Lawrence Zimmerman, what's your take on this? Lifetime <laughs> appointment, the reason for that is that the, the theoretically a justice gets in there and doesn't care anymore about the rest of the, the political world that got them in there in the first place because they have a lifetime job. They don't have to worry about future employment. They don't have the pressure that someone maybe with a term limit would have. What are they going to be on the back end? They don't care. They're going to do their job. That's why, right, we have lifetime appointments. Well, also, Ted, when the Constitution was written, the average life expectancy of people in, in America was a lot, you know, half of what it is now, right? So maybe it shouldn't be, maybe there should be a minimum age like 60 when you get on the court. Yeah, I mean, we talked earlier, you need that experience. But on top of that, I mean, listen, I'm all for term limits for most of our officials, uh, absolutely. But with the court, kind of like you said, we also need a length here. The Supreme Court is a very, is the most important court. And the decisions shifts what happens in the country. So you don't want every 10 years a big shift, a big shift. You need consistency, continuity. That's why judges should be in office longer than most other people because you got to interpret the law. There's, you know, consistency, stare decisis, not to bore the viewers of legalese, but just consistent opinions. And then again, to your point, when you get a lifetime appointment, you never know how they're going to be. Justice Roberts is now a swing vote. He's sort of moving more to the left. He was appointed by conservatives. Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Gorsuch haven't been reliably conservative either. So you never really know. And, you know, Justice Scalia is the best justice in the history other than Justice Warren for criminal defense. <laughs> All right, Barbara Allen up next. If a justice is healthy and fit for the job, sure. Having several grave episodes, they should step down and not fall asleep while sitting. Poor Ginsburg did several times and she should have been retired. I commend her on her accomplishments, but she wasn't a well woman. She should just let go. Um, that's a little bit uh, iffy, um, Imran and sorry, because that's like uh, taking the driver's license away from a parent. I mean, when do you do that? When, uh, how do you decide when somebody's not fit health, from a health standpoint? Because Justice Ginsburg had, did not lose a beat um, during oral arguments just this spring. She was sharp as a tack from her hospital room. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that that would be my retort to that particular uh, uh, juror question, um, because uh, Justice Ginsburg didn't miss a beat. She was really on point. Unfortunately, uh, her health saw a serious decline this year, and now we have her her passing that we're all mourning. Uh, but uh, listen, I think that uh, if a justice presented uh, on the bench with some serious health problems that were really affecting their ability to, to make decisions, to do the job that's uh, expected of them. Um, I think that there would be some mechanism in place to ensure that uh, that justice would perhaps step down uh, and then there would be a nomination process. Uh, I'm not a, a, I don't put myself out to be a, a SCOTUS uh, historian. I'm not sure if that's happened in the past, but um, that wasn't the case with, with Justice Ginsburg. She really was on point and she kept going back to work. She had some hiccups health-wise in the past few years and she went right back to work. And I think she was on point uh, until uh, the very end. Uh, but I do think that there would be some safeguards in place if a justice presented uh, with problems where they couldn't really ha handle the, the, uh, the job and, and really have a cognizant grasp on the issues before the court. Um, I'm not sure if that's happened before. Perhaps someone else on the panel knows. Um, I don't, nobody's been forced off the court. Uh, Rosemary Romero says, no, I don't think the Supreme Court should be a lifetime mm -hmm. appointee. It's too long for the people, and I don't think anybody in power should have that. The world's changing, and government should change to reflect those changes. Um, what do you think, Candace? It's kind of a good point. The world is changing. Shouldn't uh, the rules change if, if need be? Yeah, the world does change, but as we see with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she was able to help along the other justices that were alongside of her see that the world was changing. So. If she had a term limit, you would not have seen her trajectory change. You start out as it start out as a junior um, justice, if you will. You're kind of lower on the totem pole, and then the longer that you stay on it, the more influential that you become. And in addition to that, the court changes. People leave, people pass away, and so you're dealing with a whole new court. And once you stay on, like Ruth 
um, Bader Ginsburg did, then you have the opportunity to be more influential because you know how the job works and you are just well positioned in order to be influential to those around you. Mm, good point. Cheryl Lynn says, no, maybe not term limits, but based on poor health for sure, getting to that other point that we talked about earlier um, of fitness. But I think everybody's in agreement that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was mentally fit to the very end. I want to thank my panel, Lawrence Zimmerman, Imran, and Sari, and Candice O'Kelly. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you for watching. We'll be back here. We're here every weeknight, Monday through Friday. You're watching Court TV, your front row seat to justice.